Well, good evening, folks. This is Stream of Consciousness. I'm SJ, and I'll introduce my co-host and producer, Heather. Good evening, Heather. How are you? Hi, SJ. I'm fantastic. So, it sounds like we have the possibility of a Sean Stone interview tonight. And Sean is the son of Oliver, and certainly has a very interesting uh, biography. Uh, quite accomplished person. Multiple artist in many forms. So, would you like to talk about him a little bit? Well, of course, I'd like to talk about him, but even more, I think I'd like to introduce him. Um, Mr. Stone, would you be? Would you prefer me to uh, refer to you as Sean, or is it Mr. Stone to? <laughs> I'm not James Brown, so yeah, Sean is fine. Sean, I figured that, and thank you so much um, for being here with us tonight. I understand that you only have um, one hour for us because it's, it's kind of late, and I'm understanding. Um, I am so excited, right? I've never done an interview before, and so this is like a real big deal for me. Um, I have initially saw um, your interview with Douglas Dietrich, and since then I've been watching a lot of the interviews that you've been having, and it just seems like you have a, a big uh, database of knowledge for what's um, happening in the in the media today or, or in an alternative media. And um, I specifically, the, the you said a few things in some of your interviews that um, I wrote down so I could remember to ask you about. And I know that one of the things that you're kind of passionate about is the war and the, all that that's going on right now. The what? Which, which war you said? The war that's going on in Israel. Uh huh. So would you? Amongst if, other if, places. <laughs> yeah. Well, so if you wouldn't mind telling us like your take on it, like, just in general, where you stand. Uh. All right. Well, I guess we can jump right into the heart. The heart. Yeah. Which that's is, what. That's the way I do it. <laughs> uh, Middle Earth, as they call. Um, what was it? The British used to refer to uh, the heartland of the empire, the heartland of the earth. Which, which is basically, yeah, Israel is on sort of the western end, Israel and Turkey on the western end, and, uh, India would sort of be the eastern, Pakistan, India would be the eastern end of the heartland. It's basically the underbelly of, uh, Eurasia, which is Russia, China. And so the British strategy was always to keep this region destabilized and, um, basically susceptible to war and conflict because, uh, the great fear of the British Empire, which remember was a merchant banking empire, um, based on uh, mercantile trade, right, which is uh, mostly um, uh, ocean-based historically, and to this day, frankly, most a lot of a lot of our oil and trend, and trade goes through shipping, right. So the enemy has always always been land-based um, formations such as Eurasia, which basically was, you know, the threat of Europe, Germany um, allying with Russia and China, and being able to uh, consolidate some kind of uh, commerce and uh, financial you know, transactions to build up the greatest uh, population of the world. You know, Eurasia has the most population. It has the resources of the world. It has f enough food to feed to feed each other, uh, to feed the planet, really. But it was almost the self-contained block if it ever got together. And so, because that's always been the traditional enemy of the British Empire, as I'm saying, they, they work to destabilize and create conflict, especially in the underbelly. So going back to the 19th century, you have the Crimean War, where they're, you know, they're, there's warfare uh, between the Greeks and the Turks, between the Turks and the Russians. Uh, the Russians always want warm water ports to the south, um, and that carries into Afghanistan. Remember, Afghanistan was a great game of the 19th century, where Russia and Britain are fighting in Afghanistan for that territory, and that's what's going on to this very day. And so, all these new formations and new players and the Americans coming in are just a, Americans are just a continuation of the British Empire uh, against the Russians. And I, I'm, I'm sorry. No, do you think that the um, Crimea, ha that there's recently some pyramids discovered there, could that have anything to do with that being like the base? Um, I mean, the, in terms of the, the pyramids, I mean, the pyramid technology indicates something that's more ancient as far as uh, energy grids, for example, how, you know, remember right now we're, we're operating um, with, with oil and natural gas being the major energy basis of this planet, right? And everything on this planet operates and functions only based on the amount of energy produced. Yeah. So 
if we, you know, if we're talking about pyramids, we're talking about a different time period when the society, you know, probably the civilization probably was not as as um, archaic as they'd like us to believe, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, brick, you know, just brick brick, brick layers and 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 um, sorry, stone stone cut stone layers and uh, fire, you know, and uh, fire makers. I mean, you're talking about a society that could build pyramids, implementing basically implementing technologies that we can't even fathom. Right. Yeah, yeah, we think we're really smart, and we have no idea. We can't even wrap our minds around that. So, the, you know, whoever could build these pyramids, obviously, it's a tremendous, uh, it's a different type of energy. It's a different type of application of energy. It's a different, um, it's a completely different civilization. So whatever those pyramids are, I don't know how much they necessarily affect what's happening now. But what we do know as far as the energy production of the planet now, based on oil and natural gas, is that the Caspian Sea has one of the greatest deposits of natural gas underneath it. And so since that was discovered, you know, there's been incessant, there's been constant conflicts over the bordering countries, right, from Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, uh, Afghanistan, all these countries to um, to secure pipelines uh, to get the natural gas out of there. And that also plays into the current Crimea situation, right, with the, um, the Russians looking to secure the Crimea and the back, what was Baku. Remember, you go back to um, German, the World War II. Germ- the Germans almost, I think they actually reached Baku, but I think that they reached it, they were very close to it. And the point was, if they'd gotten Baku in the Crimea from the Russians, uh, the Russians basically would not have been able to fuel their 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 arsenal, their war, you know, their war. Mm, with with that finite was, resources, right? Well, we're talking natural. We're talking natural gas. Right, oil. gas, oil, finite. Is that what they refer to as finite resources? Well, no. I mean, uh, actually, the indications are that um, oil is not really finite per se. It actually, um, it's it's actually uh, naturally, it's actually not a fossil fuel, as it's mm. been a mis- mis- misnomer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the actual science indicates that oil deposits and, and fields are actually replenishing themselves, so it's actually more of a naturally occurring phenomenon within the earth. Um, so when there actually is, there's not really any finite resource in the universe. The universe is infinite. Are there in, infinite resources? That was my next question. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the universe itself is infinite because once you know, once we start to apply nuclear physics and understand the, the basis of all atoms, right, just being a collection of, of particles, right, uh, at, uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, mm-hmm. and even more basic substances. Once you understand that, and as Einstein says, all matter, all matter is energy. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what that means? That means that it's just a question of applying our understanding of that to transform um, elements. And yeah, that's like the well, free process. energy, why wouldn't we just use the sun? Well, again, the sun is, is, is a complicated thing because you're dealing in terms of if you want to utilize the sun, I mean, there are people that say solar. I'm not personally a proponent of solar because I think it works for limited amounts of energy flux density because you can't produce it doesn't produce that much energy per se. It produces maybe enough for your basic living. living oh, to needs keep everything going, but in not households, right. but not as far as an industrial society that's actually building and expanding and growing. You need to apply. Uh, Extra. That's <laughs> why I'm I'm a proponent of fi- the fission process and the fusion applications that we've come to understand: cold fusion, uh, yeah. uh, fusion, these evolutions of fission uh, into fusion, because. Um, it's ultimately, it's like, we, as opposed to just taking the sun's energy, we're saying, why don't we replicate the power of the sun? And then beyond fission and fusion, then the next steps, which would be a Tesla-based technology of applying the energy that does res- that does surround us. But again, it's, it's a question of evolving technologically from step by step. What um, would it do to us? I mean, it could be dangerous to us? That kind well, of amount of energy? I mean, again, you know, what is dangerous? I mean... Fire is dangerous to people. Literally. Yeah, electricity is dangerous. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the fundamental problem is fire. Fire is dangerous. It has always been dangerous. It's always been a hazard. Once you were, once man was given fire, he was given the ability to burn and you know burn people and just, and 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 firebomb his enemies. And uh, and and for that reason, you know, it's it's always a question of a double edged sword. That all all evolutions of technology, which is just the techniques of man's application to survive do threaten his fellow man because it, it boils down to are we going to pursue um, the advancement and, and betterment of all men or are we going to basically uh, try to subdue and, and enslave people which 
is, has been the prevailing philosophy of empires throughout history. Right. And that's what we have inherited as an American Republic, unfortunately, has inherited the British Empire and that mentality, which again is predicated on resource control and acts and basically, um, you know, controlling the, the, the supply and access to money to own those resources as assets for the empire. Okay, I can see that's a good way for me to segue into some things that I had written down um, about the American administration and the British administration. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Rothschild um, Zionism. Right. Okay. And um, people, I think it really, it, it, I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I've been listening and I, and I hear what people say, but I didn't really understand it until... Um, just recently, I think it was yesterday, um, that the Israeli um, establishment is not, it's not Jewish people. I think it's, you know, you don't have to be Jewish to be in, in the Rothschild, the Zionists or whatever, even though that they're stationed there. Mm. Um, and, and who are their enemies? You know, because it seems like the war is going on right now with South Africa, Ethiopia, um, you know, pa- Pakistan, Syria, all that. But um, are they all like a, a combination of enemies with Israel? Well, I'm, I'm confused. The war with South Africa. Um, oh, no, just that's where, well, I'm thinking that's where it's going to go because, um, and and I think right now there's it, it, this thing is India being involved, you know, and then the more and more I think enemies collaborate it just creates more and more war everywhere. Right. Well, India involved in what, though? India um, being compromised. I Let me see where I wrote it down. Because India is really special to me. I, I think that India is, is important. Um, but let's... I want to go back to the is the Israel thing with the Rothschild. Mm-hmm. So, um, can you just... I mean, I know that they had this the thing that started in 1946... Um, about the security fence, you know, a wall that they 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 built up, and over a period of time, that this is like all built up to where we are now. And now well, we're trying to build a wall of, in you know America. That wall that that they want to put up is that the same kind of idea that behind it? Um, you know, uh, in different in different ways, but um, I mean, Israel's always been. A tricky question, and um, you know, again, it goes back to not just the fact of the, the, this past century when it was established, right? Um, because mm-hmm. it goes into this issue of the Bible and whether or not the Bible sees it to the uh, Israelites. And the question, see, to me personally, I'm proclaiming this. I say, look, Israel should exist as uh, as a gift of the God of Abraham or Abram or Brahma, right? In the tradition of the, of, of actually it goes to Hinduism as well. Right. But it's, it's the tradition of, uh, the later tradition of, 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 of Judaism, Christian, Christianity and Islam who are all the children of Abram. Abraham. Right. And if it belongs to those children, basically they're the children of monotheism, the one God, um, then it be- really belongs to all people. And I think there's a lot of confusion because if you look historically, there was the kingdom of uh, Judah, and then there was Israel, and they were actually two separate kingdoms. And, and you know, Israel apparently was, was uh, the twelve tribes, right? Right. And yet these twelve tribes got scattered and lost. So to this day, I'll, you know, we don't really know what happened to those tribes. There's always there's been a lot of argument that some of the tribes ended up in in, in England. There's like the lost tribe of Israel being England is like one of the um, arguments. There's the issue of maybe Denmark tri- being the tribe of Dan. Um, there's uh, there's the, the question of whether or not some you know the tribe of Israel ended up in America or whatnot. So there's this right. Well, eventually there's, they would have trickled down. Well, that's a, that's my point is that there's this tremendous confusion around what actually happened to those twelve tribes and who the Jews really are. You mm-hmm. see, and there's the the issue of the Ashkenazi kingdom. Or, um, I'm sorry, not the Ashkenazi, the Khazar kingdom. In uh, it was I think it was the seventh or eighth century converting to Judaism, um, which then, you know, basically when that kingdom as a whole converted, right. um, many of these people became Jewish. And so then there's the debate of whether or not Judaism is a religion as opposed to a race. 
right? Because yeah, there are there are many Jews who are linked genetically, right, and right. that's provable um, by certain genes. But then, obviously, you know, why, Judaism is is very coveted in the sense they don't particularly like um, people converting to, to to Judaism. It's not like Christianity and Islam who actually um, you are go open, join the church and they're open. happy. Yeah, they're very open to to bringing uh, to, to spreading the to spreading the word, to spreading the word of God. It, it, Judaism traditionally seemed to be more um, uh, insular in that regard, and so I think the problem to me with Israel was that when it was created, as opposed to being what the United Nations initially wanted it to be, which was a, a United Nations protected land, right, that mm-hmm. historically housed Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and had been called Palestine by the British when they ruled, right. Mm-hmm. Um, that land should have, I think, remained under international auspices and been, at, if anything, a republic not predicated on any one religion. And I think that's since the time the United States and Russia both backed Israel as a, um, a Jewish state, mm-hmm. we've gotten into this morass, which is going to be endless, of, uh, of, a, of a country predicated on uh, one people ruling it, than, you know, in this case, Jews, but doesn't, you know, to me, it's just, it's like, it's, it's not in the principle of what a republic or a, con- a country or, an, or uh, even a kingdom should mm-hmm. be. And the, the truth is that, you know, Jews, Christians, and Mos- Muslims worship the same God. Mm-hmm. And so, in my personal experience, I've come to understand that and see that and proclaim it. Mm-hmm. And I believe that ultimately Israel can serve as uh, a template wherein the three religions will come to find that unity and and, and yeah I hope so I really do um, you said once on a on an interview and I was really interested to hear you you elaborate when you said that um, the Zionism and um, you know maybe what we call the Illuminati okay and just on a general term maybe they're um, somewhat of like a cog in the machine or like there's something that is necessary to keep the world turning. Well, that the, look to me, the Illuminati is not. Um, <laughs> we're not. We're not talking about uh, just a physical human uh, level of consciousness. When we're talking Illuminati, we're talking about um, the, the fallen people. angels. The fallen angels who uh, come from different star systems, who come from uh, higher orders of consciousness, descending into the human realm. Mm-hmm. And uh, at that time, you know, uh, in the book of according to the book of Enoch. You know, seducing and tempting uh, human women, uh, teaching men the the skills of both um, metallurgy and agriculture. Um, so basically, both th- things like I said, you know, fire th- th- that can be used for uh, making min- making uh, uh, copper and alchemy and uh, and, not, uh, and basically, yeah, exactly for for uh, al- alchemical, let's say, um, purposes of building. And then the, the other side of it, you know, being destruction, right? It, the Illuminati is both. They are both the dark and the light. They are both um, here to challenge and educate. Um, it's not a simple, you know, the, the evil Illuminati rules the world and the Rothschilds control it. It's not that simple at all. No. Uh, the Rothschilds are very much a uh, public, more, o- more overt uh, aspect of the banking uh, side of things, going back to obviously... Um, you know uh, their their influence and control in Europe in the in the 18th from the 18th century on, but they are not the the Illuminati. Though I don't right. think. Well, I you think know what I've I've noticed I've been I've had a coin and it's got the Elizabeth. It's in a I don't know if it's a sovereign coin and I so I've been looking up um, coinage and stuff like that. And if people really want to know, you know, follow that or know the involvement they can just like study that it's the history of money mm-hmm. you know well exactly I mean the, the creation of money is very much how they've befuddled us and I think if anything the Rothschilds have more to do yes I mean look the Rothschilds are definitely not from here originally right <laughs> like that right but they have a lot more influence I think in terms of uh, you know certain secret societies that are interested in manipulating markets and controlling finance. Mm-hmm. Really, you know, the world is, is, is so complicated that it's like, I just don't like to boil it down to any one family or any one faction, right? It's, 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 you have to constantly evolve and challenge your perspective because believe me, if we're sitting here talking about the Rothschilds and how they control the world, 
um, we're we're not in we're not in the privy of really understanding how that works. Yeah, we're walking into a dark room because we really don't know where to go with yeah. that. Yeah. So, um, would you say that it is like a cog in the machine? It's like people think all oh, the corruption, and I mean, could they be? Could there be a bigger picture, like from a universal lens that we're not seeing? Oh, that's that's what I'm saying. Is that these we're talking about beings and 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 what we're called fallen angels or angels that um, Elohim, whatnot, whatever you want, you know, there are mm-hmm. many different names, Nephilim, um, that have that have come here and, and I believe are still here and that are helping to guide the evolution of man's consciousness upon earth because that's what it's about. Mm-hmm. We've been in a cycle of these empires, basically, this, you know, this growth and decay cycle over and over, the rise and fall of these of these power structures and, and it's, it's, it's getting to that point, I think, of redundancy. Mm-hmm. So the reason that they call it this time period, the end of history, that was like a term that was coined in the late 20th century, is because we're becoming so aware of it. We're becoming so knowledgeable about the history. We're able to, we're able to collate these vast libraries and put them online and have conversations with people across the entire planet. And so this planetary evolution is now occurring on a global scale rather than what used to be on a local or at most a national scale. Mm-hmm. And that's why I believe that we are hitting a point where it's like either we're going to evolve and break through into a new phase of consciousness and understanding of our place as humans in a much greater galaxy of beings, entities that have been here and mm-hmm. are affecting us, and yet we have not seen them or acknowledged them en masse. Mm-hmm. That has to and that has to occur, or else we will conti- we will fall in the same pattern that all these previous empires have risen and fallen for the last few thousand years and it's becoming boring hmm. so is it is it um, is it too early to, to say or is it safe to say that maybe we are the Illuminati <laughs> I would say if you if you under, if you come to understand who you are and you ask yourself what you're doing here and you start to work on remembering it yes you can mm-hmm. you you, you can attain to that level of illumination. I've had that feeling, you know. I've always had that feeling kind of like, you know, we have the power Mm -hmm. to change things. Exactly, exactly. And that sense of self-empowerment, it's in a certain sense a first time in human history where the common everyday person has that awareness and ability. Um, Throughout time, you know, it's been very difficult for the commoner to attain to the level of what, you know, what the elite can think and know and have and because the elite let's say had a, a different level of understanding or they had an oral tradition that was passed on to them or secret traditions as such like as, a, an ancient lineage or a priesthood or something exactly lineages and priesthoods like the Templars and the, the Gnostics and Masons and Rosicrucians and you know other secretive orders for example they, they're all across the planet we, we, we oftentimes forget we think oh the Rothschilds rule the world but you know you're forgetting about the Asians what about Ch- the Chinese I mean they've you know they've been uh, they've been have, they've been uh, ruling uh, an empire going back four or five thousand years, I believe. I mean, it's it's at least three thousand, four thousand years old. So yeah. you know, they talk about you talk about you know the the bankers like the Rothschilds. These guys are money managers. They're the ones who issue the lines of credit. They're credit people. They don't have the collateral. Mm-hmm. You want to you want to know the gold is? You look to the east. That's where the gold is. Yeah. So, and then it, there's there's much more to be to be um, found. I know. Well, there's not, there's, there's most of the gold is hidden from us. For example, I mean, you want to talk about like how much gold is on this planet, mm-hmm. and the actual official statistics of a, like a few, I think, what is it, a few hundred thousand tons of gold is a complete lie. Maybe that's the infinite resource. Because you know, you know, like oh. the, the elemental, um, you know, like I don't know. For instance, the people say the Nibiru, they need that gold. For their um, environment to, survive. yeah, that was, that was one of the theories about Nibiru was like using the gold to um, maintain the o- the ozone layer. Yeah, uh, and look, gold is gold has so many different powers, including um, for human health. It has a spiritual resonance. It has, I think, it, I think it frankly affects um, different dimensions of, of reality. It's used for if you think about uh, where does gold come from, it comes it comes from uh, from stardust, when stars are born, from nebula, it mm-hmm. creates gold. It, so it may be used uh, for, to create portals, for example. I mean, there are so many applications of gold, I think, that are far beyond 
our understanding. Well, yeah, but like the capstone on the pyramid, isn't it supposed to be supposedly gold? It was supposed to be, yes. And who knows who, when, when that was stolen, but apparently when it was taken off, it deactivated the Great Pyramid. And, and all maybe the, all of the uh, pyramids that are aligned with it as well. Yeah, perhaps. That would make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to uh, bring on to the call a mad painter. He's got, um, we got SJ also. SJ is my, um, I'm his protege. Mm-hmm. And a mad painter, he's, they're just like the veterans, the backbone of the station. So I know a mad painter has got some, because he follows this and he's very um, knowledgeable about it. And I know he's probably got a couple questions. So a mad painter, are you on here with us still? I'm here, but I'm here just to to observe. You're doing Laura, great. Laura, you don't have any questions? You're doing great. You keep it up. Oh, thank you so much. So, yeah, where do we go uh, from here? You tell me. So people are, I think people are really confusing, and just by the um, media, the mainstream media, it just gives the Jewish people a, a bad reputation, and they're being, because um, it's not who they are. The people that are running the planet, or what supposedly, and the, are not the Jewish people of the Judaism. Well, I don't, I don't think even, okay, let's put it like this. I don't see the Jewish control and the power structure to be inordinate in the sense that, um, you know, maybe in Hollywood and, 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 you know, self, self-admittedly, but, you know, that Jews have a lot of influence in Hollywood. Um, but aside from that, you, you know, you look at, you know, the whole planet. I mean, the Saudis are tremendously wealthy. <laughs> you know, the Chinese are sitting on, you know, huge, historically huge amounts of wealth. Um, yeah. Russia has resources you know, you know, that are that are just a question of being mined, and, and and once they get their country in better shape and industrially again, you know that they can access. So it's like the wealth is is available to man. This goes back to the issue of resources. You know, it's a question of transmuting our resources. We have we are given a universe that is open to us to explore and expand our understanding and be able to transform elements and tra- you know and transform our environment. So to sit there and say, you know, for example, people are worried about water running out. It's literally just laziness that puts us in that position. We, ne- we know we have the ability to desalinate uh, salt water, for example. Um, you know, we're sitting on a planet that is mostly water, so how can we sit here and say we're running out of water, except no, we're just running out of, um, not, we don't have the motivation right now to apply techniques that even President Kennedy told us to do back in 1961, 62, when he said, let's do the North American Water and Power Administration and work on diverting rivers and working with the Canadians. On Is that when the, the Hoover Dam thing kind of... No. Uh, Hoover Dam was completed by uh, under the Hoover administration. I think it was completed in 33, 32, 33 time period. Um, that was done. But I mean, the point was, they were, you know, there were great works projects in those days. You know, FDR was doing the, the Tennessee Valley Administration. Mm-hmm. There, you know, there was an initiative to build infrastructure that has been sapped from our country since 1971, 72, really. I mean, it began really under, under um, the Vietnam War, but at least at that point we still had NASA. Since 70, 71, 72, we've fallen into this, this decline and uh, inability to uh, put resources towards infrastructure and industry and only focusing on the military side of things, military well, industrial. Do you think side. that maybe that could have happened because of the balance of power? Like, you know, we've got, you know, for this term we've got the Republican, then it switches to Democrat and it goes back and forth. So people have their own agendas and as far as being president. And maybe they, if we stayed on one track. Well, no, it's not really so much that. The fact is that we haven't had a president since Kennedy. Uh, they've all been controlled. Kennedy, right. Kennedy tried to buck the system and he got a bullet to the head for it. And, you know, it's not, you can't really say there's a difference between Democrats and Republicans, because look at, uh, Nelson Rockefeller was a Republican Party guy, right? Mm-hmm. He became vice president of the Republican Party. And his brother, John, is a Democratic Party guy. So, these are the two heads of the, dev- of the Rockefeller family, the most powerful family in America, right? Richest family, mm-hmm. so-called richest family in America that we know of. You know, there's always more mysterious factors that are behind the scenes that we don't know, that are less public. But Rockefeller, you know, oil and banking family. And these guys are running, you know, the two parties, the same way that Harriman and Bush are were partners going back to the 1930s, I think actually 20s, but uh, 1930s, Harriman and Bush are, are partners in Brown Brothers, Harriman, and Prescott Bush is what? He become, he's basically the emeritus, one of the eminence greaves of the Republican Party, 
George Bush becomes the Republican national uh, chairman, is, mm-hmm. and, and Harriman is, is the benefactor of the Democratic Party, and these guys are business partners. So what is that telling you? That they're all working together. Well, no, that they're under. That they, yeah, it's it's like like you know WWF wrestling, right? <laughs> right. It's like every time that this season, so you're on a soccer team, and uh, you're going to be on this team this season, and then you're going to switch next season. <laughs> right. Exactly. You watch sports. Sports is the same thing. Hey, you guys are fighting each other. You hate each other. You're on different teams. But guess what? You're all being paid by the same people. Yeah, and next and next year, the year later, you're you you're likely to probably cross paths with these people that you're opposing or fight or you know playing against. Exactly. So it's, it's tremendous theater that takes place, and I think people are fed up with it and they're aware. That's why the, the popularity of the president and the Congress is so low. I think people just don't know what to do about it as a problem. That's the next step is what do you do? How do you actually reform this system? I think the campaign finance is a major step, and I love that this kid is, you know, this high school kid's out there putting out a nap. Who would that be? Uh, I don't know his name. It, it was came out recently. Who you know, he developed an app that people can download that they can track. Um, you know, each congressman and who's who's donating to that congressman. So oh, that's cool. Figure out, like, you know, yeah, who does that guy actually work for? Who are the major um, contributors? Contributors, exactly. Yeah, well, what is it that I, David Ike was saying in, in one of his interviews that two of of American population, two percent are Jewish, but fifty percent of the political campaign contributions are coming from the two percent. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, corporations are not really, they don't really have a uh, religion per se. And again, um, look, Zionism is not Judaism. There's, there's, for example, look at Herzl, Theodore Herzl, who's the founder mm-hmm. of Zionism. This guy was probably an atheist. I so mean, is that's it a cult? But it seems to show. I tend to think so. I mean, like, like more of a secret society is like a cult. I just Before don't, I don't, it's a political party or a religion. I don't know what Zionism actually means. You know, I I really I could frankly be a cult. It just doesn't it it doesn't quite vibe with my understanding. Right. Well, I think this is what I wrote is that Zionism is a secret society putting in their agents into positions of power, and so it has nothing to do with being Jewish. You know. Right. What well, doesn't exactly? And the thing is that, for example, Obama is probably a Christian Zionist, right? I mean, he's paid by um, uh, the Pritzker family, right, in Chicago. The Pritzker, mm-hmm. one of the major um, uh, Zionist Jewish families there, uh, from mob, you know, running mob operations, right? And so that's right. you know that's who's basically was backing Obama. So you know, again, the issue is like again, we don't know when we're dealing with things like Zionism, like like Masonry. Um, there, there, and there are, and again, like skull and bones. I mean, there are many secret societies and that have uh, principles and and ambitions that are not told and known to the general public. Right, but they're all cogs in the machine, or they're all part of the the grand. Well, I believe that. I believe in God, and I believe that the devil work. The devil is God's greatest uh, agent. Frankly, you know, to me, I agree with all, you. All these things that are so-called evils and challenges and, and corruption and, and, right. and atrocities, that they're all well, just maybe um, protecting necessary. the good people. Well, they're necessary. It's not about protection. It's about knowledge. We chose we chose the fruit of knowledge when we take the apple, right? Adam mm-hmm. chose the apple and he chose knowledge. Well, guess what? Knowledge brings pain. You can only learn through pain. You cannot learn if things are, are beautiful and wonderful and sweet and nice. You're not going to learn from that. You're only going to learn from the challenge and the opposition and the suffering. So we chose that path. You see. So, at what point do you think does humanity fall away from that? Because you know, when you you read all of the ancient texts, you know, it seems like it was pretty well presented all then. How do you mean? Like Moses, like with the the burning bush, or all of the things that were experienced back in those days. It was it was, seems like they were more um, pro. What's the word I'm looking for? It's a pro word. I, they were more um, obvious. Like mm-hmm. God said, here it is. You know, and then they had, even before probably recorded history, had technology that was beyond our time right now. So at what point did we fall away from... Well, um, um, Atlantis. I mean, Atlantis sank. The dark the dark um, sorcerers, basically the dark... Uh, you know, if you, if you believe the tradition of uh, the Tablets of Thoth, you know, mm-hmm. the dark sorcerers basically conjured entities and, and demons, who are, what are called reptilians and things like this. Reptilian, they were actually referred to as being reptilian in form. 
um, and these entities or demons uh, started to influence and um, decay the culture. They actually they they killed the kings and became imposters. They shape shifted and looked like the kings. I mean, a lot of we. No, <laughs> no, wait, no. That that brings to to my mind George Washington. Why? Because well, he had a thing about collecting teeth. I guess he fancied different kinds of false teeth. And um, that's where actually they got the word veneers from wood flooring is because his teeth were wooden. And I think that, and I don't even have a source for how I know this, but his something was wrong with his mouth to where his jaw was like unhinged open and they had to make his teeth with a hinge so it held his mouth closed. Mm. So That's interesting. <laughs> it is interesting. And it's stuck in my head, that's for sure. Because yeah. the, way, the way he's holding his mouth is because his, it's kind of the teeth that he had made, that's how they kept his mouth closed or else he had an open mouth all the time that he couldn't even close. It would have, to, it would hurt him or, you know, it'd right. have to take a lot of effort. And I think that's where they also, or where the idea came from for the chattering teeth, you know, when you wind them up. Mm-hmm. That's it, funny. Yeah, that, that's how I explain it to where I'm trying to explain it to people what I'm talking about, about his mouth being open. It's unhinged like a snake. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know if that has to do anything to do with the dark arts. I mean, Washington obviously was a preeminent Freemason, mm -hmm. but I tend to like, you know, for example, what he stood for in terms of his farewell address to the American people, you know, and his idea of no entangling alliances. Um, we have fallen away from Washington's conception of foreign policy, and it's evident, you know, we've, we've had, you know, speaking of Israel, it's like, I don't see why America should be having an, uh, uh, any kind of alliance with Israel or Great Britain or any country, I feel like we should we should look at every country as as an equal and you know weigh every situation depending on how it affects the American people. But unfortunately, we don't live under the auspices of of wanting the best for the American people anymore. We live under the auspices of a uh, corporately controlled international uh, oligarchy. Let's say. Yeah. Yeah, I think I don't think there is really a, a, like an, a nation of Israel, like the people of Israel. There, there's no people left of Israel because the, um, the Zionist movement they like set up their camp, you know, there, and they've been working out of it, if, you know, the whole war machine since it was built there. Right. I mean, you know, again, it, it's it's that's a tricky situation because you you have a lot of. Um, Eastern European immigrants, especially, who've come to Israel and treated it like what, you know, from the Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern point of view, what happened during the Crusades, when mm -hmm. you had a bunch of Europeans descend upon the Middle East and create a kingdom. Yeah, and there's your la there 12 tribes that were lost is because they kind of um, dispersed from that area, right? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, the question is what happened to the 12 tribes and, are, you know, who are the 12 tribes? So, who is the real, you know, who are the real Israelites? And again, to me, it's like Israel is a state of mind. It's a state of, uh, of accepting oh. all mankind as you understand. Israel is a state of mind. It's not a, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a genetic trait. No, I don't think so. I mean, that's, that's a good, that is such a good, I, um, analogy. I'll, I'll tell you why, because Israel, I believe, stands for Isis, Ra, and El, the three, the Trinity, the Trinity of, um, uh, in going back to Egyptian culture, you know, the female principle, the, the female power, the male power, and then L being Lord, or basically the the, the the tie between the two. So that's a very interesting. You know, I've never I've I'm a religious scholar, and I've never been able to see it that way. And I appreciate you you mentioning it because now I'm going to have to go back and reevaluate everything. <laughs> right. No, yeah. that's the, the point. Is that you know people have gotten caught up into this whole thing about Judaism. It's like no, if you believe that Christ is Messiah. And he, you know, his bloodline of David, and he came to basically cast out the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, I don't think Jesus would be very happy with the rulers of Israel in this present state. No. In fact, um, you know, if you really want to go back to Israel, then why don't you find the bloodline of the Maccabees, for example, or some of the, the previous rulers, and go into um, a state of kingship for the country, but again, predicated on monotheism, because... Israel is supposed to be the, is supposed to be the place where the three religions come together. That's why Jerusalem is so powerful that it has 
you know that it has um, uh, it has the Muslim it has Muslim prayer site, Jewish prayer site, Christian prayer site, all respected mm-hmm. there. That's a tremendous energy. So yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I think that we are going to live to see the day where that happens. I, I hope so. I really do. I really hope it. Well, I feel very strongly that because I think my grandpa told me. <laughs> but, and look, I believe that Christ in, in some form will return and, in a sense, cast out the Sadducees and the Pharisees one more time. Now, what now? what is it that is bad about them? The Sadducees and the Pharisees? Mm-hmm. Well, are they, they dark? I they, mean... Are, no, it's not about being dark. It's just that they profess to uphold uh, law when in truth law is spirit. You know, we don't have, we don't need the letter of the law. And people of, you know, of all religions fall into this problem where they forget the basic understanding of being good to your fellow man. You know, the parable of the, of the good Samaritan. That's the mm-hmm. critical thing of all, of all existence. What you is know, wrong with people? With each other. We're supposed to uphold, well, it's all, all laws just predicated on the ten mosaic commandments. That's it. It's, it's really yet, simple. I don't understand what, what, what's wrong we, with people. Because we fall into the trap of, of, of lawyers, and, and again, this is how the legal system has created the entire corporate structure of the planet, right? Every person on this planet is pretty much enslaved by the corporations called states. Every nation is actually a corporation. It was created by the banking structures to take uh, ownership of those people and hold them as collateral. Mm-hmm. Against oh, the, do you mean like Indo-European or Indo-European stock? I'm not sure of that reference, but the point what I'm saying is that you basically are bonded at the moment you're born by the Federal Reserve Bank. Right. Yeah. No. And that's that's yeah. exactly what I was talking about. Um, the Swami Prabhupada said that Americans are Indo-European stock. Oh, you're talking about blood stock. Well, it, uh, we are like a stock, like a right. And exactly yeah. that's the whole point. It's we humans are stock, and it's again it goes back to this whole issue of farming the herd and culling the herd. So are we? You know, who, if we're a stock, who's, who's the owner? And are these beings, you know, the Illuminati so-called? Are they ultimately of an alien intelligence and higher consciousness? And what, I, I believe that we'll have a much, look, after things, wh- whatever comes in the near future is not, it, it may be, it may, it may fall into the alignment with the end times. There may be a great devastation by fire, um, or flood. Uh, there may, you know, there may be a chaos and destruction, but, Whatever occurs is, is part of the necessary uh, chaos that brings awakening, that brings awareness. Because people don't wake up from nightmares unless they're jarred enough, right? right. They have to be sufficiently jarred to wake up. And right now, people I think are still in too much of a sleep state to wait awake, even though this is the time. Right now, it's, it's this is the awakening. We have access to the knowledge. All the information is there. If you want it, you can find it. You know, yeah. people are talking about it. There's information online. You know, we have to share more information and be honest about it. That's the big problem, too, is there's deceivers. You go talking about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. These are, these are the deceivers. These are the ones oh. that maintain power, so they create fictions. They create legal fictions. Or yeah. or they're mistranslating um, the, you know, texts or whatever. Yeah, of course. Tra- mistranslation is a big issue historically in terms of people not, um, even, even across languages. That's why people fear other races, they fear other cultures because they don't speak their language, right? They don't understand mm-hmm. the custom. Mm-hmm. So they look at, you know, they say, oh, the Quran, Allah, oh, he's different. Allah is God. It's the same God. It is. The same, you know, they have the Quran. You don't read the Quran. The Quran only talks about Moses, Abraham, Jesus, Mary. What? What's wrong with the Quran? <laughs> right. Oh, People say that. They go, wait, what? Oh, my God. They read the Quran. They're like, wait a minute. I'm God like, is God. Hey. I'm so confused because all the all the all, you know it's all about it's all about the Jewish and Christian uh, prophets here. So, <laughs> so I'm good, you know it's not about it's not just about yeah. Me. You know my grandpa he was a mason. Um, he was a wonderful man. And he told me a lot about religion and God, and, and I believe everything that he said was true. He said that um, in the Bible it says God says there's many mansions in my kingdom or something to that effect. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what he was saying is you could be any religion, it will bring you to me. It, it, you know, all the religions have a place here. Yeah, but that's the thing is that truly a Freemason, and, you know, I am one as well, and that's what I believe is the brotherhood of mankind. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're supposed to, in principle, uphold um, anyone uh, so long as they are good, as they are a good man, right? Yeah. Uh, and, or woman. But really, it's, it's about goodness. And that's yeah, what is the, um, his motto was uh, support each other. So that's all it was. Correct, correct. Yeah. Now, not to support each other in 
in evil, though. And I think that's... No, support each other. You know, if 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 somebody, you know, one of your brothers needs something, you know, it's just like it's your family, you know, do unto others. And that's the funny thing about this whole Ferguson situation where, as you said, if your brother is in distress, now what's the what's the signal for distress? It's your your arms in the air. And mm-hmm. that's, what, <laughs> that's what's been demonstrated by a lot of politicians and people since the Ferguson shooting of the young kid, right, with his mm-hmm. arms up in the air. Well, that's Aww. a classic Masonic signal of distress. So it indicates that perhaps there's something greater at work. Absolutely. As though I think the Masons have always been at work in the great revolutions of all time. And you can see it certainly in American Revolution, you can see it in the French Revolution, you can see it um, in the, what was it, 1848, revolutions across Europe. Um, I think we're getting to that point when we're going to see some tremendous uprisings and upheavals. Yeah. And I think that people, um, people have so many, like, uh, things to say and negative opinions and things because they don't know. And they they might want to understand, but they're not they don't have the capacity to understand because they can't open their mind to it because they, because the knowledge is there for everybody like you said the knowledge is there because we, again we chose the path of knowledge when Adam ate from the apple and that was the path of, of learning and so we are in, as a result we are learning we're in this we've been in this school for fish for the last couple thousand years and now we're out of it and now we're becoming water bearers mm. so, well, well you had to bring up fish and uh, we got about five, you know, eight minutes left until the break, and since you brought up fish, I'd like to bring Esther on to have a chance to talk to you and an opportunity because um, cause he gets pretty deep and, and heavy, and he, he knows what's going on. You know, he knows about the understanding and the knowledge and things like that. So, SJ, you want to um, ask Sean anything that's come to mind during our last hour? Oh, I'd like to interview Sean for a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> you have 14 days to spare. <laughs> well, you know, I read up on your career, Sean, and it's fascinating. Uh, you certainly jarred a lot of people when you converted to Islam, but the way you did it uh, in detail, uh, personally, is wonderful. What a nice transition. And I uh, followed the same kind of path that you have I'm 65 uh, I got tuned into this fairly early and kept track of it for years I agree with a lot of your conclusions and uh, your intent is wonderful so I would like to compliment you for your diversity of thought well, thank you I try to I try to keep an open mind <laughs> well you certainly <laughs> open minds uh, with your uh, thoughts, with your speech, it's delightful to hear you. And uh, inshallah, you say, right? God willing. <laughs> inshallah, exactly. You know, um, your career is really amazing. So you do a lot of. Uh, I would love to talk to you at length sometime about your art. Uh, mm-hmm. You're a well-known broadcaster. You've done amazing interviews. Uh, you're involved with everything from street theater to uh, classic Can radio and TV. <laughs> well, it's <hope> that, too. <laughs> and I'm, it's so detailed. I mean, how long have you been doing this, Sean? This being uh, this mission? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, when you went out, uh, you started working with your dad's show, didn't you? Well, I started working with my dad. I mean, really, at, at seven, I would say, well, two on Wall Street. But, you know, as, as a kid actor, I was working with him. But it was really just from the point of view of, you know, being a child who's given direction and uh, having to perform without necessarily loving what I was doing at that age. Uh, so I would say my real collaboration started with him at 19 when I worked with him on Alexander. The, uh, the film with, he did uh, 10 years ago now with Colin Farrell and Angelina Jolie and that was a uh, great experience because I got to shoot the behind the scenes uh, portion of that oh no uh, well, if you got a little bit more time join us yeah. after the shower yeah yeah let's do, we'll do like 10 15 more minutes thank you thank so you. much stay tuned everybody you're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com we'll be right back Revolution. 
Got everyone here. Sean, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay, perfect. Mad Painter's with us, and I'll just pull back in. SJ, I I very much do appreciate your time. Um, take your time to call or call in and, and talk to us. I don't know if you've been interviewed on the station before. I don't think so. I'm no, sure maybe maybe I have. You know, I'll <laughs> tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you what I told everybody else. You know, I've watched. I've been watching. You know, some of your interviews and. Um, you do such a great job when you interview people, and you could see it in your eyes that you have so much more to say, but, you know, you give your guests um, so much respect, and you just let them, you know, talk it out, finish, you know, everything that they're saying. And, and even though you have much to contribute, it's, it's a matter of respect. I noticed that. And so I wanted just to give you the opportunity to, you know, talk it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Know? you. What, what like you, where do you like what you stand for and like what you claim and and I think you've done a really good job relaying that to us. Um, I'm you got my my fanship for life. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. And I'd like I also I liked the interview that you did um, with your co-host and there was two other gentlemen there and you talked about a lot of really interesting things. Um, uh, do, are, do you recall what I what I'm referring to? I mean, we've done we we used to do, we used to do like roundtable kind of discussions with two people on on subjects like 9/11 or JFK. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. But they were younger, um, and one of them had been like in in the entertainment industry, you know, I guess his whole life too, or something like that. He's wearing a green shirt. Yeah, it might have been 9/11. Yeah, that was a good one. And, in, and the thing about 9-11 that, um, that people have failed to realize has been evidence since day one is the trillions of dollars that was missing that was announced on the 10th of September. Was what? The, the, on the 10th of September, right, the day before it happened, there was, a, I guess, um, trillions of dollars, I guess, that they were unaccounted for, something serious in yes, the American uh, budget. Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld admitted the fact of, uh, I think it was a couple trillion missing from the Pentagon's budget. Uh, the accounting books had all been screwed up. And then, lo and behold, the next day, um, I think the, the accounting department was one of the departments that got hit on that wing of the Pentagon. Um, both the Office of Naval Invest, not Office of Naval Intelligence and the accounting department kind of got hit pretty bad. So, on the whole, I mean, 9-11, I think, boils down to actually a cover-up of financial fraud and you know it, it, the, the uh, Secret Service agents had said at the time they said all of our case files our evidence you know all got destroyed and lost when those buildings came down so yeah, I think when it boils down to it I think it'll be proved that um, you have to look at the target you know why was, why were those four buildings you remember was building one, two, six, and 7 all collapsed the World Trade Center site why were those four buildings targeted? Why was that wing of the Pentagon targeted? And it's going to boil down to a cover-up of financial crimes and, and, and destruction of evidence, basically. Um, yeah, Douglas uh, Dietrich mentions an, it, kind of an interesting factor in that um, Pentagon thing is that the whole building was concrete, except for the part that was hit was uh, had steel or something was different. Mm, it's been, been recently renovated. Yeah. That section, the wing that got hit, recent renovation probably was what he's referring to. And why it was they a little bit different? Which yeah. is normally you think the Pentagon is, is the safest base in the entire planet. Uh, yeah, the whole you know, thing was just a bad, it's like a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, a nightmare or, 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 you know, again, speaking from the point of view of awakening and awareness, well, like, and, like, and it could be, and, 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 you know, this might be kind of harsh, but, you know, a taste of our own medicine. Yeah, I mean, that's that's true, too. I mean, 
look, from the point of view of, of universal history, uh, it's, it's a wake-up call for America. It was definitely a, you know, a tragic day for America. But how many days have, have every other country on the planet suffered? And oftentimes, you know, as a result of American policy, or wars, or whatnot. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, 3,000 people dead on, you know, in one event is a large amount. But then you think about how many people have been killed as a result of, you know, wars that we've financed. Yeah. Reached. Uh, you know, armed sides, and you know, I'm not blaming it's not, it's not blaming America again. We're talking about a financial oligarchy that feeds and preys upon um, conflict. And going back to the very beginning of it, the British Empire, that imperial philosophy, the imperial system, is predicated on creating conflict, owning access to, basically, controlling warlords to get control of natural resources. You know, to exploit the, the minerals and, and um, you know what's under the earth, mm-hmm. and you know, ultimately making creating money to propagate a system that only feeds less than 1% of the ruling class. So do you think that, like, I know that all the all the innocent people that have died and are being killed, and, and we even have some um, people from Syria and over there and in the lens of fire, we have them come on, and and they, they're very humble people. It seems like there's a little bit of a ill communication going on between the nations of people. Mm-hmm. Well, there's more communication now available than ever. We can communicate through. Well, I mean, that's that's yes, just it. Now that we have the um, the opportunity to to talk to them, you know, in person, voice to voice, you know, and, and exactly. we're finding that they're yeah. not evil and killers. And of course, and this is going to this is going to help dissipate the uh, this is going to dissipate the uh, possibility of wars, as we can actually um, you know see the enemy and recognize them as human beings. And also um, understand that the real enemy is closer, is closer than we think. It's really at home, you know. To, that, that's the true enemy. It's the true enemy is the system of power that's oppressing people all over the world. Yeah. Well, do you think that like life is but a dream, and maybe that death isn't what we think of it, it as, is like an end or a? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. There is no death. Uh, yeah, hundred yeah. uh, percent. This is a dream within a dream. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's no, it's it's very much similar to you know a dream state that what we call a dream state. This is a different mm-hmm. form of dream state, and we are going through levels of awakening and consciousness that ultimately expand the knowledge and awareness of beings higher than us. And, um, also, you know, ultimately it is it is you know God's creation and for a reason. So I don't Yeah, you know, I, I think don't it was a kid, here. a child that had put it to me this way. Um, one, one time they said, um, you know, it's like when we're awake, we're really dreaming. And then when we die, we finally wake up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's one way of understanding it. And who knows if we finally wake up then, but the point is that we do wake up to a different. Yeah, it's like, uh, but, we, but it's like we woke up and we're like, gosh, that was a long nap. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I hope so. So, um, let me ask you this is on a lighter note. So, I, so you're married and you have a family, I take it. Me? No, no. <laughs> Wait, you are no. married? No, 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 I'm not. I'm not. Huh. Okay. Well, I don't know why I thought that you were. So, um, so what, I have a couple of just general questions that aren't really deep or anything like that. I want to know if you've ever flown a helicopter. <laughs> I wish. No, no it's, it's really hard. It's it it like fun, though. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, SJ's got his, oh, he it turned is. it off. Thanks. We got SJ back. Um, have you been to Greece? I have. You yeah. have? How do you like Greece? Well, I only, I only get to go to Mykonos. And that was amazing, you know, that was a great experience, but it was not necessarily visiting the, um, you know, the classic um, Greek ruins, for example, that I'd like to visit. Was it like the roads were all, like, dirt roads and... No, Mykonos? Yeah. No, Mykonos is, a, is, is, you know... Is that where, like, everybody goes to go on vacation, the, where all the buildings are It's a party city. Yeah. It's a party city, so, I mean, it's an island, but, um, you know... It's not a rundown. Is there cost of living? Is that is that more affordable or is it more expensive? Well, Greece right now is going through a tremendous 
economic downturn, obviously. Um, so I don't really know the situation. It seems huh. like they're in bad shape economically. Okay, and have you heard about um, the stuff that's called Aerogel? No. Aerogel is it's um, like a compound or some element that the, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory had sent a mission out. They collected this uh, cosmic space dust with Velcro or whatever, and then they brought it back, and they come up with this aerogel, and it's like it, you can't penetrate through it. You can't burn through it. It looks like a hologram, and you, you'll, you'll have to check it out and see here. And I'm just wondering if you knew about it, because I think that it, it has a lot to do with our what's to come, like the technology that, you know, we're dealing mm-hmm. with and we're coming up with now. You're not wrong. The technology, I believe the technology that gets released to the public has been developed at least 40 or 50 years in advance. Yeah, I know that, I know that this aerogel has something to do with these missing planes. I just know. I think the, the holograms, uh, uh, regardless, we have to come to a better understanding that, that the nature of this reality is holographic. Mm-hmm. And so what we're, playing, what has been presented to people is holograms being, um you know, uh, plays of light that you can you can put a hand through. Mm-hmm. May not even you know, maybe there are things that are more holographic that actually seem to have um, physical physical substance. Right? substance. Like human. Look, this whole planet I'm saying is is holographic in a certain sense because it's a play <laughs> of light. And okay. uh, you know, we are we are you know we are very empty beings. You know, we are most mostly um, moving particles that are just vibrating so fast that we appear to be solid. Right, but really our mass, like, is less than that of an app, I mean, you know, probably like an apple core. <laughs> you know, yeah. our, our individual physical mass is tiny. So the issue of the hologram, I think, should play more into human consciousness. And yes, I mean, missing planes, it goes back to 9 11. I mean, I don't think the planes as we saw them on TV mm-hmm. were the ones that they said went missing. I don't think those were the same, uh, seven, but 747 or 767 jets. Um, the John and Lear, you know, you've heard every okay. different angle that it could painted missiles, or you know, it could be this, it could be that, it could be um, the death ray. You know, there's so many different takes well, on yeah, it. I mean, def- definitely, definitely, the planes did not cause the collapse. But I'm simply saying that even the, you know, John Lear talks about how you know he's a CIA, he's a former CIA pilot, who says, look, the velocity that those planes have been going at at that altitude would not have allowed them to penetrate the steel structure of the World Trade Center. They right. couldn't have cut through that building. At that at altitude, they would have been going too slowly. They, if they had gone faster, if they had been going to the speed they were said to be going at, they would have basically, um, um, what is it? They're, like, they basically would have lost uh, their ability to, to maneuver at that, yeah. at that speed. They would have been going too fast at too low an altitude. So he's saying that they, could, those, they couldn't have been 737. They could have been, you know, Again, were they holograms? Were they painted missiles? <laughs> Did we lose you? Hello. Try to get him back, Heather. No, the call dropped. Too bad. And so did the server. Hold on, I don't know if the server dropped. I'm having problems with my side. No, you're on. You're on her. Okay. Yeah, no, the call dropped. It's probably because he was talking about um, some heavy stuff. And, you know, Sean, it, I was probably not listening because he wouldn't be listening right now, but um, if he calls me back, then I'll add him to the call right now. We can now. talk with him further. Yeah, he's, he's calling right now. Excellent. Please add him. Hi, Sean. Call dropped. I'm not sure if it was had to do with the content of our conversation or it was just a glitch. <laughs> <laughs> and that said, that said, nine eleven. <laughs> right, right. SJ, take it away. No fish, though. No talking about fish. <laughs> uh, you know, talking with yourself is really a treat. Uh, thank you for doing Heather's first interview. Uh, she's doing wonderfully. In terms of learning how, yeah, she's doing excellently in terms of being a host. And it's wonderful to have you for a guest. I'd love to talk to you about at least a half dozen that come immediately to mind 
subjects not related to anything we've talked about so far. Mm, that's exciting. <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be a hoot? Uh, we could talk about uh, the fusion of religion and physics. Mm. You know, I see people having a tremendous uh, gained ability to determine their own spiritual nature. Mm-hmm which is pretty cosmic, you know, when you get right down to it. So far we've had top-down religions, and uh, it sounds like you're exploring alternative forms of religious thinking Mm -hmm. that are certainly spiritual. You know what I've always thought? I've always thought that the reason that uh, Jesus, when he was born, and they brought him gold and frankincense and myrrh, I think the gold was uh, to orbitally arrange his monoatomic elements and maybe he ingested the gold I mean just a thought well I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing frankincense and mirror I would highly recommend people take yeah in, in, with this uh, with the with the epidemics of Ebola and other diseases MERS and other respiratory things that are going around a lot of a lot, there's going to be a lot of outbreak of illness I think in their uh, yeah MER yeah. is like is the most uh, highly co- concentrated uh anti you know bacterial you know it'll set your teeth in your mouth if your teeth are loose it'll make them go in place uh-huh yeah no you know, the mirror is really really healthy really um, great uh, to protect you against these diseases that are coming you know I tend to do a lot of sweet grass smudges and I do love to heat up and smoke some frankincense God, is that the loveliest smell? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it does have a purgative effect on floating uh, vapor mo- uh, v- vapor molecules. And these are supposedly uh, liquid born. But getting on to other topics, you know, I'd like to see what you think about uh, astronomy, uh, what you think of astrology, what you think about uh the coming period of uh, possible change. Uh, are you of the opinion that the end of the Mayan calendar heralded a, a start? You know? Yeah. <laughs> I remember all the well, people yeah. going. It, Can it you was, remember? Yeah. <laughs> Go yeah. ahead, please. No, I just said it, it, it was the end of the world, you know, it, it, but it, it didn't happen on the 21st. I don't, <laughs> I, mean, I don't even know the Mayan actually ever said the 21st was a hard date. But again, it's like we're talking about the end. The, the end means the beginning. I don't. I, I like ends because ends ends mean new beginnings. So, right uh, yes, we have hit the end of the age of Pisces. We're into, we've entered the age of Aquarius. Now it's a question of humans to just recognize it. I mean, you know, we we can evolve. We are. We can we can ascend. Our it's just a question of how quickly we're willing to open ourselves to the possibilities of these of these ideas that have been around for a long time. But have have been whispered, have whispered, and talked about in quiet and privacy and secret, because very few people, let's be honest, want to be like me and out, out there talking openly and being able to be vilified and you know crucified as a result of what I'm, you know, what what we believe to be true. Well, you know, it's always down to one individual at a time, right? It, it boils down to you being able to at any moment, uh, as Buddha said. Uh, Overcome basically what is it? You can stop the world. You can overcome uh, the world at any point. It's your choice. Mm-hmm. You know that's the whole point of uh, having exposure to all of these histories that people are learning about. You know, you can't expect to be able to fix everything immediately. But you know, every time you gain. Uh, you add a little bit of understanding to somebody's, you know, tool bag. I figure that's really what we are. We're bodhisattvas on this ball going through space. Mm-hmm. You feel that way yeah. more and more. Um, are we bodhisattvas if we if we open ourselves to recognize ourselves as such? You bet. Um, I I don't even think that there's enough. You know, in truth, I think there's just one, and I think that each that there is only one. There is only me. There is only you. But how do you say? 
fraction, we're fractured of the singular consciousness. We are, we we're only fractal, fractal, we, fractal, exactly, little, in, in, and holographic in the sense that we have yeah, the that's mentality a, in us. You know, we we belong. We are in a wonderful period of time, don't you agree? I mean, we've got all this incredible expanded awareness of possibilities, and we're going around creating, uh, you know, in, empowering people to create their own realities. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's the time exactly. It's the time to hopefully um, to create those better those better realities, those better futures. Um, because I don't, you know, at the end of the day, the timelines thing really does trip me out, and I think that there are mm -hmm. so many different rea realities that are that are emerging and, frankly, being uh, appearing and disappearing every moment. <laughs> and this gets yeah, do you think that the '60s and the, yeah. all that acid? Do you think that had something to do with it? Sure. I mean, it, it, it was a question of of people having to be prepared for this time period. And, and then, yeah, the, then the children that they created, I mean, we're, the, we were the future, you know, and now yeah, we've got this... Yeah, a lot of those, I'll a lot of those people that dropped acid ultimately turned into a bunch of crooks and, and you know, materialists. <laughs> so right, well, I, I, I have so much faith. Was, I have a lot of faith in our in the upcoming generation of the, the younger people. Like, my, my daughter, she's 19. So that group and that age group, I really have a lot of faith in them and their intelligence because, you know, and their ability because... Of, they are working with the technology that we still don't know oh, about. Yeah. No, I love I love kids. I look at kids and I look at them as being so much smarter than their parents. And that's what I makes me worth the time. You know, I see the, I see the light uh, I see the light in their eyes, and it's, and that's my only hope is that truthfully, those young ones who are um, being sent here at this time, mm -hmm. they're the ones who we're supposed to be listening and leading. learning from. No, no, we're, no, we're, we'll. Ultimately, yes, but first we have to teach them and, and help them to, um, you see, you have to, you have to be the, the lights, the guiding lights for them, you see, because it, it's very difficult to be thrown into this, into this density without having, uh, mentors and people to guide your way. I think that's what that? a lot yeah. of the vaccinations and, and things like, with this, the pro, or deprogramming or whatever, it's just targeted towards them because they do have that, that ability. Mm -hmm. And those abilities, mm -hmm. but are, but are they a threat? No. You know what? It always brings to mind a song lyric from the '60s. You know, teach your children well. Mm -hmm. Remember that song? Wasn't that a beauty? Well, yeah. It's, 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 Was it Crosby, Nash and Young, SJ? Yep. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, you know, we had a lot of good music. We had a lot of good books in the 60s. We had a lot of good thinking going on. We had tremendous artists. Uh, and we had an economy that was comfortable to explore other things than just becoming a wage slave. We came out of a generation just coming out of World War II. I did. And, you know, I watched this all change. You know, now mm -hmm. it's not, not like it was. Right. Right. Boy, it's yeah. your, you know, what's, what's your favorite, uh, how old are you? Um, I'm like 30. So you're a young man, vital, full of juice. Uh, you were born in the 80s? Yeah, 84. I'm glad you're alive. Okay. <laughs> For, well, Me too. Not, you know, I don't put down the younger generations. What I've always done is try to enable them. You know, I fought a lot of battles so you and I could talk. You know, they were small battles. It was everyday battles, right? Isn't that part of it? Do it every day. <laughs> That's what I said. You know, history history eventually gets boring if you keep fighting the same battles over and over. <laughs> so, yeah, you gotta, you ever, I gotta ask you, Sean. Did you ever like ha aspire to be like when I grow up? I want to be an astronaut. Or when I grow up, I mean, I'm sure you didn't say. Well, maybe you did say, and you can tell me. When I grow up, I want to be like my dad. Or what was like? What was your dream? Uh, honestly, there was just two things. First, um, I wanted to be a baseball player when I was like four or five. I would say I was really into it. And then by about seven, I said, "Well, I actually want to be a writer, but I can always play baseball and write in, and write in the off season." <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty good conversation. And, uh, that was that was literally the point that I realized I wanted to be a writer. And I transitioned 
So the acting and, and the and the roles that you've played and things like that, it's just, they, that's kind of just like a pastime for you. Yeah, honestly, I didn't like acting particularly when I was a kid. I really was shy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I hated the attention and the pressure being on me. I'm and the person. lights. Yeah, the light and you're in the camera and you're facing the light. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you probably, like, you grew up with a lot of the people that were, were familiar with household names. Things like that. I was watching uh, a movie. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I, I obviously met a lot of famous people, and I didn't really uh, consider them to be famous at the time because they're just kids they, like you. you know, so yeah, who who do you admire, like in in that industry or whatever? Who is one of the biggest like the people that you respect and admire the most? I I mean, at the end of the day, it's, you know, I just. You know, I, His favorite I admire, uncle. <laughs> I, 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 I honestly, I mean, I just, you know, I, I admire my father. I, you know, I, I very He's much. A wonderful him. man. You know, look, look to his example. You know, as, as being a man in, in a time that, frankly, there, there's a, there's a dearth of men who actually stand for principles and stand for things and actually uh, speak their mind, speak their truth, and are willing to. It's from the heart. You yeah. tell it's you from the heart. Take it, you know, exactly. Take, take, you know, take the consequence um, of what they believe you know, is the right thing to do. And I think that there's a social consciousness there that you don't see in a lot of people, um, it, at least in this time period now. Yeah. Um, a lot of cowardice. So, I, you know, I don't, yeah. like, I don't, I don't want to say, say, you know, who I admire, and, you know, because I don't want to, like, put it down to any, you know, right. any people, but... Well, I guess that's that's not. I'm not. I've never been famous, so I guess that's how it is uh, from your perspective. And that's like kind of what I wanted you to to show us. You know, is the person that you are is not the person that we see on TV or you know in a movie or you know. Well, I mean, I tr- actually to be honest with you, I try. I, I would hope it is, and I think that's one of the interesting things about acting is that how you know people confuse the fact of. These, you know, the fact that these people are, they're actors, you know, they're portraying something that's not really them, you know, they're, they're moving and they're, and they're speaking dialogue and they're, um, they're, they're doing things according to someone else's direction, right? Yeah. And yet, you know, the great ones, the really, the, I think the ones that we most adore and, and want to aspire to be, um, are the ones who actually do stand for what they're playing and they actually oh, do they, they actually have personalities and, 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 and something that's well, coming from within and they're not they're, yes yeah, they're choosing they're choosing roles based on the fact that they want to, they believe in that project they believe in that you know playing that character they want to uh, emit something into the world you see yeah I thought it was kind of strange I, I saw a Christian, I, I saw a Kristen Glover um, film and then at the end of it he went on David Letterman I guess for his first um, live interview or whatever when when he was starting to get popular, but he came on as the role in the movie that he had played. It was before Back to the Future. Maybe, I'm not sure. He did a, a movie called Ruben and Ed, and he came on the David Letterman show as his character, and I'm like, who does that? I mean, I don't think right. I've ever known of anyone that comes in, like, playing the part uh, in their movie that they just played, because they, right. be, they want to express the people that they really, truly are. Right, right. With the have a voice. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, we could go on for hours, but yeah. Thank you so much, and I so appreciate your time. I, you know, and anything that I could ever do for you, I'm, I'd be more than happy. Just, just say the word. I'd like to Absolutely. have you on uh, again yeah. sometime. I'd like to interview you and talk with you myself. It certainly has been a pleasure to listen. Thank Absolutely. you for. Yeah. Be great to get. I'm elated. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate you having me, guys. Thank you, Sean, and I hope to talk to you in the near future. Absolutely. You have a good night, hon. You too. Thanks, guys. Bye. Okay, are we still at the studio? Okay, good. We're still on. And I'm going to go ahead and plug the station, SJ, and then you can talk about your fish. (laughs) Okay. I actually have a question, Estee. There's a guy named Johnny Johnson who did a fishing show. Have you heard of that guy? He's from Arizona. 
Uh, no, unfortunately. I thought for sure you'd have heard of him. It's a guy that did a fishing, um, you know, documentary or show, How to Fish. He well, I stopped fish. watching TV in 1968, oh, that's and uh, Barbara brought, bought me a little TV set when I was up in Queen Charlotte in 2000. But I used it to watch uh, cassette tapes. Oh. My friend, my friend liked to uh, save old films on cassette tape, and I didn't go to the theater more than probably three times in a thirty to forty year period. So I'm divorced from a lot of mainstream media. Over. Yeah, um, I forgot you stopped watching TV so long ago, and. Silly of me that I'd forgotten that. I'd, I'd know that about you. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought you did a rather great job oh. uh, talking to Sean. Uh, not bad for your first shot, you know. Yeah. Well, I, way, I figured way it. Way to go. It was superb. You did an excellent thank job. Thank you. That means a lot coming from you. Did you, you I'm your now, protege. Did you like that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you are, and and uh, the reason why I got this going was to give you a chance, along with, uh, you know, the first people. Vibes was my first producer and did an excellent job. Mm -hmm. So uh, both of you have gained a little bit of experience, and what do you think? You feel comfortable? Are you ready to do your own show? Oh, I could, but I like you. I couldn't. It wouldn't be the same. Well, any time you want to do a series of shows, mm -hmm. uh, you can put that together. You certainly have as much freedom as I can give you, okay. which, is, which is total, <laughs> just about. Yeah. Well, what, what I need to find out is that somebody, I forgot, who, another host had told me that um, the produce, or the, the hosts and producers have access to their archives for their show. So I'm wondering um, if I... Am entitled to having this access to the archives. Can I please have the password, or is, what's the rule? And I know that the way the rules are, but I don't know. I I signed up to, for the archives way back in year one, and used them a little bit, and then they got erased accidentally, so that wiped out all my early stuff. It was sort of cool. Uh, I've got a few recordings from that period that I put on my hard drive. But basically, I always figured this was um, transitional radio. Uh, it wasn't necessary for us to have it recorded for posterity. Uh, some bits of it have been worth recording for posterity, but unfortunately have gone the way of transitory things. And in a lot of ways, our society is a bigger version of revolution radio. That's the way I've always thought. So I'm not too uptight about it. The way I yeah. figure it is I can always create great radio anytime I feel like doing it. Yeah, well, you are the champ. Oh, I'm just, I'm a grain of sand in a world full, full of beaches. So you're the salt <laughs> of the earth. How's that? Well, I am a little salty at times, yeah. <laughs> never, you're you never sweet. Uh, I take naps. It's wonderful, man. Like uh, here, we've been having glorious uh, Southern California weather here in British Columbia. Uh, the valley is a beautiful growing area, and we just had great harvest. And tonight, I get to cook up these monster, delicious tomatoes that a gardener friend of ours gave to us. She gave us these two huge plastic bags full of these huge tomatoes, mm -hmm. and I spent uh, a couple of hours chopping them up, and uh, I'm making uh, spaghetti with meatballs. Oh. And it smells... Since I used these tomatoes, and these are real tomatoes, you know, they're just... They're not, you know, big, but don't, no taste. These are tasty. And you know what? This is the first... Uh, spaghetti sauce I've done in a while that smells like my grandmother's. Hmm. Did she use yep. sugar? Yeah. Spoonful of sugar. Mm -hmm. That takes the acid down. Mm -hmm. And uh, good cheese, you know, at the last. And right now, 
the cheese has melted and been, Barbara's been nice enough to stir uh, through the show. And I dropped in to, you know, check it out. Oh, God, it's good. So we're going to have uh, spaghetti with meatballs and uh, fine spaghetti. Not angel hair, but, you know. Oh, my gosh. Let me tell you what I had. And <laughs> dinner. Oh, I mean, you, I had the perfect dinner. No, I was actually at a, at a girlfriend's house. I'm at a girlfriend's house, and her mom had, like, a little dinner party, and she made a ribeye steak. Ooh, and corn on the cob from the farmer's market, salad oh, yeah. and potatoes. Just that's perfect oh, right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, we've got a great uh, harvest season. We're in the middle of, uh, we're getting a little bit late on the sweet corn. And I always hate it when the sweet corn goes away. Uh, oh, I know. <laughs> oh, gosh, do I miss sweet corn in the winter. Don't you wish you could just have some that would come? through and, and cook just perfect in December. Yeah, really yeah but not really because um, I know with fruit anyway that when you eat fruit that's not in harvest or, or not in season, you get sick. Well, that's theoretic. It's never been a, a problem for me. Well, what did you think of, uh, wasn't it wonderful that uh, Sean was nice enough? to grace you with an additional half hour. I, I'm elated right now. I can't even express in words well, make sure how that, satisfied that I am. Well, make sure that you listen to that episode many times because you... Uh, give it a, a few days, but it'll sound like a different person talking, and then you can start going, well, okay, yeah, I could do that different. I could do that different. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah, I know, about, I know about my, my interrupting, but that's the only way that oh, I can but, take yeah. control of a conversation. <laughs> well, it's delightful to talk to kids, you know, as well as old farty adults like me that are deliberate. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> hey, you know, you're a, re a refreshing, uh, educated woman looking for more... Uh, experience and uh, more stories from friends. I mean, that's what it's all about. It. Well, I know, like, in, in ah. such, especially in the first hour. Mm -hmm. He um, he, what he was talking about is just enthralling. You know, I mean, yep, yep. I, I am gonna have to listen to that again, to so it all because it makes so much sense. Well, you know, these are all researchers. What he was talking about, the history of the Egyptian uh, uh, and Israelite and uh, the history of the Jewish... I mean, he knows, he knows the history all the back when it was like a super continent. I don't know that much history. Well, I do, and it's really refreshing to have another person traveling along a parallel path. I mean, you know, I'm probably eating this dust following him. Uh, he's certainly been deeply into the research that it took for him to give you that detailed explanation. And he's really marvelous in the sense that he knows it well enough that he can really think about it and relate it to everything else. And it's that interrelationship that is so complicated that you really got to crack in order to get a fairly accurate worldview of reality. Well, I think what it, what it boils down to is he's, he's an intelligent person and he paid attention in school when he was learning that and when it was being taught to him and he was able to put it into the right places and understand it then. Whereas I, like, for instance, have had to go back and relearn. Well, I, I you know, reading about his life, I got a chance to look up and see a lot of things he's done. You know, he's... He came to that uh, as he segued out of his teens into his serious approaches to media. Mm -hmm. And so don't feel like, you know, you're that distant from him. If you had the ability to read huge amounts of information and remember it, and he's got an ex excellent memory, I can tell. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm familiar with his turf, and he's familiar somewhat with my turf. That's why... I hope sometime in the future I can talk with him at length. I hope so, too. It would be a great interview. He's a great person. Very friendly. Quite nice to you, God. <laughs> you can't be can't beat having Sean Stone. Thank you for... Uh, yeah, absolutely. And you know what? And what, 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 
what got my attention the most is the respect that he had for the people that he interviewed and the, just, the, just the human decency that is that everybody needs to have mm-hmm. to, to, to bring a change. Well, you know, uh, he's got a class act. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, in the past that you're not familiar with that have got class acts. And, you know, there's a tremendous amount of people that nobody knows about but have a great story. And I always hoped that we could bring that out in a lot of people who have never done Internet radio before. Right, well, um, and and those people are are probably the... They're probably humble people, so they don't want that. Oh, I don't know about them. that. Yeah. <laughs> My experience is some of these characters, you get a go and you can't shut them off. I mean, it's so... The ones who yeah. have a story, the ones who have a story to be told. Oh, you know, there's so much variety in the human being. You know, we try to simplify it by sort of generalizing, but you know what? Every person out there is an individual, and you can't say what they're going to be like. They've got a great range, huge emotional range, a, a huge intellectual range. You know, you never know what an individual is going to be like until you well, meet them. Well, that's why I changed them. my major from psychology to religion, is because I realized after taking all my psychology recs that, um, every, like exactly what you just said, everyone's different and there ain't no telling. Yeah, <laughs> I, I took it in a slightly different direction with a fair amount of, you know, I am a comparative religious scholar, but that doesn't mean I know everything about everything. I know a lot of things about a lot of different things, and it's been really great to learn them, but I don't know all of it. Right. You know, I have my own ideas about it. You know that I am a Universal Life Church reverend. Yes, yes I do. So Very I can marry you or I can bury you. And that's primarily why I got, uh, why I joined the Universal Life Church was to get that credential that makes me officially a, a member of a religious group that allows everyone within it the freedom to have their own belief structure without interference. And with a, lot of, yeah. a, tremendous, a tremendous amount of support, actually. Very friendly group. Uh, I get a letter from them every month. Says, hi, you're doing fine. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I, well, like when, I, when I get married, I'll Oh, sure. I'd be delighted. Uh, and I can uh, get the paperwork, no problem. In British Columbia, it's delightful. Will you come to, will you come to Arizona? Maybe. You talk me into it. Start talking food. <laughs> here, here well, let's it. not let's food. not um, jump the gun. <laughs> we could always plan. Yeah. Well. Well, you know, life is full of uh, life is full of mysterious connections, and I've had the delight of encountering people that I could appreciate. Uh, maybe it's just because I could appreciate them that they were so wonderful. You know, I've had a relatively low number of clunker humans in my experience, and it's lead, led me to think of the United States not as some, you know, stupid bunch of people. I, I think of them as uh, wonderfully interesting and generous, generally. <laughs> Pardon me? A wonderful and interesting species? Uh, people, you know, uh, human beings, you know, and they have a tremendous range of tremendously diverse. I was appreciating uh, Sean's diversity of oh thought. Oh my gosh, he's amazing. Well, we all are, you know. Yeah. Once, once you get into it. See, here's the thing. We're amazing to somebody that that we can be amazing to. You know, there's other people that are going out and, hey, look, I've heard that all. I heard that. We were talking about that 45 years ago. Blah, blah, blah. You guys are just figuring it out. There's all levels of awareness and you don't have to be ashamed if you're learning and anybody who puts you down because you're learning obviously hasn't learned enough right right well yeah you, wise people choose um, what they say wisely because they understand the, the importance of saving each breath 
Well, you know, if you're kind to people, is uh, you know, uh, everybody is flawed. I make mistakes all the time. But if you're generally trying to be kind and think of the other person first instead of yourself, you're going to make an, a lot of nice, really good moves. You know, your life is going to uh, be less hassled. You're going to be able to spend more free time thinking about the wonderful things that you can create. In my, From my perspective, I like making stuff, though, you know. Yeah. You're a builder. I'm a maker. Yeah, I'm a maker. I'm a. I try to be a Renaissance craftsman. You know, not necessarily a Renaissance thinker with you know the incredible ability. Although I aspire to that. You have everything you say you are. Uh, yep. Pretty much. Good. That's how you got to see it. You know. Well, you know, I got some cool stuff to be. Uh, so yeah. it's not that. It's not that hard to be straight up about it, you know. I can do it. I've got. I've done it. I've got pictures to prove it. I've got. What can't, what can't you do? Uh, let's see. Crochet. No, I yeah. learned how to crochet when I was a kid. I can't. Uh, but speaking of wool, I can't knit. Can you sell, Can you put a shoes on the horse? Uh, I can shoe a horse. Yes, I have a complete stash of farrier. Uh, my farrier's equipment, including a farrier's uh, forge. It's uh, propane, and it's wonderful for doing uh, small, like knife blades. I can do knife blades in it. Can, I, can I, you wind a bobbin? Yes. Oh, gosh. I'm going to think of something you can't do. Well, you, you know, if you don't think of something first, <laughs> well, besides you know, quilt, because that's just, if you can crochet, then you can knit. Hey, there's a thousand things. Don't worry. There's a thousand things I have no ability to do. Uh, but in you know, maybe. <laughs> I, I can sure change a diaper. I'll tell you that. I could change a diaper lickety split and do and do a good job. Of, you know, I knew what diaper rash was all about by the time I was seven. I had. I'm the oldest of five kids, so I had three sisters and a brother, and I learned how to do an excellent job of swapping uh, diapers. Can you ride what? the bar? Is it ride the bar? I forgot the term. You well, know the term? I, I've been trying to think of it when you go from cross. the river to the ocean and you surf with a boat. What is that called? It's called crossing the bar. Crossing the bar. Okay, now I'm going to remember that forever. No, yeah, I, I, well, I, uh, I was good enough to survive some really dramatic crossings of a number, almost every river from Fort Bragg to uh, uh, the Puget Sound and a few in British Columbia and on a variety of boats, everything from 17 foot uh, kayaks and canoes and uh, ha, ha, I got one. Have, can you fly a helicopter? No, I can't fly a helicopter. I can fly an airplane. Okay, helicopter is hard to fly. Yes, well, I never was uh, able to spend a lot of time uh, in the pilot seat of a helicopter. What I did was uh, spend about a year flying uh, a... 75 to 100 foot tag line with a helicopter above me through the woods. Hmm. How's that grab you? Uh, well, <laughs> it grabs. Oh, yeah. We had ex Vietnam military pilots uh, flying. Can you, play, the, can you play the piano? A little bit. Okay. I'm just still thinking. You're such, no, no, well, well, you're, how such about what? A, you're such a great man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what about what you can do? You can do what an I interview. I can't do, you mean? <laughs> well, you can do an interview with a wonderful person. And yeah, have I don't a, there's anything I can't do and I put my mind to it. What Heather wants, Heather gets. Well, you did a good job. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep. <laughs> that was the yeah. point of it all months and months ago when we first started this, eh? Yeah. Are we good at this stuff or what? We are so good at this. You know what I'm not good at is math. Well, you know the cool thing about the interview was when you started out, you were a little bit nervous, and that was gone by minute two. 
Yeah, oh good. Because I had just finished dinner. I was a little bit a little bit tipsy. I mean I'd have a few drinks. So it just happened to be that way. I didn't do it because I was nervous and, and that was like my crutch, but I was I'm at a Hey, hey, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh butterflies are fine. Being nervous is fine. Uh, it's all part of the art. When you finally get old enough, uh, see, when you get older, you can be as cranky as you want to be, uh, and everybody still loves you. Right. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. You can get away with murder. And uh, you get to that point, you can be really relaxed in some really tense times. In fact, you learn that you're one of the people that can, you know, at least, you know, maintain a relaxed composure. Uh, yeah, composure. Maintain your composure when everything is going absolutely uh, F U. Yeah, fubar. Yeah, totally fubar. I, I, you know what? I learned that from my grandpa because. Yeah, I, yeah, isn't that cool? I love it. Yeah. We're War II. Yeah, well, no, I get it from my grandpa because I used to be a fly off the handle person. Sure. <laughs> Just <laughs> short fuse, just, use, um, yeah. you know, just hit the roof. I mean, I can't even put any. That's all I have to say. I mean, I had no control, and I, from after my grandpa was, but I've learned about patience and and you know, counting to ten, and and I mean, there are two people that can get me like snap of a finger. They can just set me off, but nobody else can. I can maintain, like, if even if somebody attacked me in public and got in my face, I wouldn't react that way. Well, you know, you know, it's too bad we live so far apart because me and Barbara are going to eat a wonderful dinner, and we'd invite you over if you just live closer. Oh, I know, I know, I'm, <laughs> I know that I'm welcome there any time, and and I've been oh, sure. going to Canada, but I'm, I'm. Oh, it's a long ways. It's a long ways. Uh, can you fly there, or can I fly there? I mean, oh yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, my little teeny tiny farm town has an international airport. Interesting. It, yes, it, it is. One of my goals in life is to fly, be a pilot, and to fly a plane. I'll tell you, it's so cool. Uh, I have been in love with airplanes all my life. I have a huge collection of aeronautica. You know, I'm a collector, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I've spent a huge amount of money collecting uh, pictures, plans, three views. Uh, okay, I hope that you're not a hoarder. Oh, God, no. I'm, okay, a, I'm just making sure. <laughs> I'm a gypsy trader. Uh, okay. Well, I've uh, I've liked collecting all my dad was a collector. My mom was a collector. Uh, all different things. And I just got into collecting because it was fun, and I used to buy and sell. I started out with model airplane engines when I was uh, 11. Do you collect stamps? I used to. I love stamp collections. Oh, they're beautiful. Mysterious God, you know. I used to, uh, I had an uncle that uh, had a great international collection prior to World War II. So we're talking about uh, 30s, 1933 probably to 1938, mm -hmm. you know, that period before the war. Really mysterious. God, you know, the African stamps alone were mind blowers. Beautifully done. So how do you like your new parts? How's your new parts working for you? Oh, I sit out. Uh, well, first of all, I'm taking apart a pair of 1940s. Windows that are very unique in terms of not having uh, the the sash weights. Mm -hmm. These guys have uh, a a spring tensioner that controls the amount that you can open the window. So they're actually a window opening limiter, and they're beautiful. Uh, these tubes about uh, five eighths of an inch in diameter that have a uh, almost a shock absorber in the sense that they have a controllable, adjustable spring opposition to the weight of the window. And it's beautiful, and they're gorgeous. They're uh, uh, made out of polished brass. Mm. Oh, they're just gorgeous, and they're all buried is brass, underneath. Is brass heavier than gold? No. 
Oh, uh, well, we have... These are buried on... Okay, we have like two minutes left, Ashley. I just got to tell you how much the, your support and in, in just you believing in me or seeing something in me to help me oh. bring that out. How much oh, I appreciate that. I've got oh, to sh- yeah, I've got to shout out to Justin it's Time. Okay. It's all good. Justin Time as well. He has had my back from since day one. If I ever ask him for help, you know, for backup, you know, to be there, he's he's true blue he's always there and my my other war hero (laughs) a mad painter because tonight I got into a couple situations where I could have had some dead air and I didn't and if it wasn't for a mad painter I would have known what to do I probably would have lost some of that composure so well you've got your it's all experience and yeah we got some great you know we got great people in our community Thank God well, for revolution. Are we good at this or what? <laughs> yeah, that's what I say. That's what I say, girl. Well, and you know, I love, we and I love you too, Vaubert. You're my favorite. <laughs> Vaubert is great. Yeah, so it's a perfect ending for a perfect day, and you can't get much better. There than you this. go. You know, you know, oh man, I got a spaghetti dinner to go to. That's you even, see what I mean? You're gonna dig it. Oh, I love it. You'll make enough, or how many, do you make a whole pot of it, or just enough for dinner? Uh, no, I make a uh, small pot of it. What I make is about, uh, it comes out at about three quarts. Mm. That's a couple couple meals, right? Well, for, I for both you guys. What I usually do is I get uh, uh, one of my large jars <laughs> with a good cap on it, and I put it in, I freeze that one. Yeah. And then I've got enough for dinner. I've got enough for a couple of meatball sandwiches at lunch.